I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's first meeting is Adam Fisher, the Chief Investment Officer of Commonwealth Asset Management, which he founded as Commonwealth Opportunity Capital in 2008 and relaunched in 2019 after a two-year interlude at Soros Fund Management. Commonwealth manages both a global macro hedge fund and private real estate assets with a thematic bent. In getting there, Adam traded his bar mitzvah money, attended law school, and started real estate investment companies in the U.S. and Asia. Our conversation covers Adam's self-taught trading, early stumbles in private equity, and a one-off encounter with Richard Rainwater that led to his creating his first business. From there, we touch on thematic real estate investing, hedging his investments leading into the financial crisis, and pivoting back to trading alongside real estate investing thereafter. We discuss the challenges of traditional global macro businesses, the benefits of investing in one-off big ideas, the synergies across real estate and macro investing, interest rates, and Adam's outlook on the markets and industry. Today's show is sponsored by Northern Trust Front Office Solutions. Sophisticated multi-asset class investors need high-tech and high-touch data management solutions for their front and middle offices. Northern Trust Front Office Solutions combines high-powered functionality with exceptional client service to help asset allocators efficiently evaluate their portfolios, accelerate their insights, and mitigate their operational risk. Visit northerntrust.com slash solutions to learn more. Please enjoy my first meeting with Adam Fisher from Commonwealth Asset Management. Adam, good to see you. Good to see you. Why don't we dive in and just start with your kind of early education and how you got involved in the investing world in the first place? Yeah, I'd say my initial exposure to it was through my father, who was a a lawyer and then a private investor. And I don't even think he knew it in the sense that I don't think he identified himself as such, but he was a early private equity investor starting in kind of the late 60s. I was born in 1972. And by the time I had sort of consciousness, if that makes sense. He was sort of well on his way. And so, frankly, my first exposure was through him. And I suppose there's lots of different ways people view their parents or their fathers as sons. You know, some of them emulate and want to be like them. Some rebel. You know, there's lots of different ways to go. I guess my path was somewhat some level of emulation or at least, you know, interest in what he was doing. And then, I don't know, you know, I know I've heard this from other people in my industry in that, you know, I was Jewish and had some bar mitzvah money that was gifts that were given to me. And I don't know exactly how it happened, but some version of going to him and saying, hey, you know, I, I can manage this. You know, I'm <laughs> certainly no lack of confidence. And so that was kind of my first foray. And by the time I got to college, it was really like a big endeavor. And I was really aggressive. And maybe it's sort of almost the antithesis of the way I trade now, but I ran it up to a lot of money and I was like very obsessed with it and, you know, blowing off classes so that I could trade and things like that. And then I literally like lost almost all of it. And so like that whole experience was, you know, I remember my dad saying to me, like when I was borderline puking, like literally physical disgust. He was just like, you can't appreciate how valuable this experience is. People (laughs) would pay the amount of money you just spent to like learn all the things that you just learned. And I promise you, like, it's kind of like one of those things that like when you get defecated on by a pigeon and somebody tells you that that's good luck, you're like, no, no, you just made that up just to make me feel better. Like, it's clearly not good luck. It's (laughs) clearly horrible. But that was sort of my arc, my arc to investing. And I'd sort of say the bookend for that whole experience was I had had some summer jobs at Bear Stearns and I was on the trading desk and, you know, I was also admitted to law school. And for a while, I was just very convinced that I didn't need any formal education of any kind. I was in the Bear Stearns ethos that 
you could just scrap your way up. And I went to my parents and I was like, look, I'm not going to law school. No chance. I was totally intoxicated. New York City, trading floor at Bear Stearns. Ace Greenberg was right, right over there. And I was like, okay, this is it. I lost the money like right around that time. It was like, okay, this isn't easy. You know what I mean? Like I actually need to go learn a whole bunch of stuff. I kind of got off my high horse, went to law school. And so that kind of bookended that whole period, but it was fun. I can tell you that. I mean, it was definitely a wild ride. So then post law school, how did you work your way back to it? I was absolutely convinced with every core part of my body that I wanted to be And I wanted to be a principal. I wanted to allocate capital. Like some people are lucky in life, 10 or 11 years old, that's what I wanted to do. And I've never changed my view on that. And that's, I don't know if that's healthy, unhealthy, but it it was my reality. And so, you know, I was maniacally focused on trying to get a job that would allow me to do that. And I got a JD MBA at Columbia. And, but I had this sort of weird background in that, a lot of the firms kind of looked at me with curiosity, smart guy, okay, but no experience, you know, that type of thing. And so no buy side, I mean, I tried to knock my way into buy side firms. You know, I sent letters to, I don't know, I'm sure everyone, KKR, Apollo, this guy, that guy. No one really took me up in the offer because to be fair, all of us look at this now that I'm in the seat is, yeah, let them go work at like one of these bolts bracket firms, let them train these people for us. And then we'll take them, right? Like, we don't want to train any of these people. Like, that's a waste of our time. We're not good at it. And I'm sure that's kind of how I was viewed. And I got really lucky because I was interviewing at Lazard. And one of the most senior principals there was offered a job to build a brand new private equity firm. And out of his non-compete, he wasn't allowed to poach any existing Lazard employee. And so he called me and said, look, I'm not allowed to take any Lazard people, but I, you're not a Lazard person, right? Would you like to join me? And that gentleman's name is Jerry Rosenfeld, who is a, a really amazing guy. And so I got lucky. Like, it was just one of those things where I, I stepped in it. And now I didn't really realize that I got unlucky too, because within a year, the firm was shuttered. But anyways, it at least got me in that circle it got a lot worse after that. Like I had a couple more jobs. And, and again, they were very idiosyncratic stories, very similar to that story. And both other times, like basically the firms got shut down for really idiosyncratic reason. So the good news was, Ted, is I barreled my way into principal side investing. The bad news was I shredded my resume because I had like three or four jobs in like four years. And Again, none of it was my fault, but I was kind of back to where I was with the Columbia JD MBA, which was people viewed me as having a lack of experience, whether that was true or not is, is debatable. So therefore I was in a tough situation where I was kind of viewed at the bottom of the totem pole. And, and so I had to think about whether I was just going to keep knocking away at jobs or become entrepreneurial. And I, I chose the second path, but it wasn't an easy call. Let me put it that way. Like it was, it was a tough call to make at the time. So what, what did you learn in those first couple of years in your kind of formative education in principal investing? I'd have to say that those first few years before I became an entrepreneur, I learned in the sense that, okay, here's a spreadsheet. Here's how cash flows and finance works and so on and so forth. I sort of evaluate my learning process based on the things that I continue to carry with me. You know what I mean? Like, did they imprint my life in any way? Was it a searing imprint into who I was? And the answer was no. Those few years on Wall Street, don't get me wrong, like learning how to model and learning how to put presentations together and things like that, and you know, investment memos, that stuff's important. But I viewed law school as unbelievably important for me, even today more than ever. I've used those three or four years as, but not really powerful. And then post that, you know, when I started my firm, things kind of really picked back up for my learning curve. So the bad news was I sort of think that those few years were a bit bereft of deep learning, but that's okay. I mean, you know, that's part of life. So how did you transition over when you went to start your own firm into real estate? One of the firms I worked for was 
affiliated loosely with Richard Rainwater. I bumped into Richard where he lived at Canyon Ranch in Tucson. He gave me great advice. Now, Richard is widely accepted to be like almost like a career whisperer. You know, you have all these people who like literally will tell you that Richard had this massive impact on them. Now, most of those people actually worked for Richard, okay? But Richard only had like maybe a half hour conversation with me, but the best thing he said, which, you know, was like hand of God type thing. He was like, you don't get it. You don't know anything. And I was like, okay, well, thanks for that compliment. He's like, no, 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 like that's your superpower. You're not shackled to anything. One of the problems that happens with people is they look at their life like a career. They don't really look at it like, okay, where does money want to go? Where does money need to go? Okay. You, because you don't have any of those sort of golden handcuffs, you don't really have anything that you are already committed to. So why don't you just look at the world with a white sheet of paper and ask yourself, where does money have to go and how can I be useful in that? That was really powerful. I mean, he, I don't think he, I mean, I think it's rote for him to say stuff like that. I don't think he was really trying to help me all that much. I think it was probably like one of those things where he says that to everyone and then the guy runs away and whatever. But it really hit me. I thought about that a lot. Like seriously, like for weeks, that's all I could think about was like what he had said. I'm like, yeah, I don't know anything. And you know, maybe it was a cop out, like not knowing something being great, but I just sort of took it at heart. I was like, okay, well, and remember this was like 2001 and 2000, 2001. And so it was very clear, obviously, with the tech bubble and the bubble and shares and, and so on, that trouble was a brew. And I looked at real estate and I was like, well, this is an asset class that has been relatively has lagged other assets quite significantly. And also, it was obvious to me that interest rates were going to come down substantially. As you recall, Greenspan brought them to like one and a quarter and they sat there for years. So like just those two combinations of predictions which was kind of my first really good macro predictions, led me to, to real estate. I knew nothing about it, literally. It was probably the asset class that no one I knew had invested in. My father hadn't invested in it, really. I had no experience with it at all. And I just decided, okay, based on that analysis, it's the right thing to do. And I'll just go learn everything I need to learn about it. And that's where I'm going to go. How'd you go about that learning process? Well, back then, I didn't have... The relationships I have now, one of the nice things about relationships is you can sort of short circuit learning. And then the other thing, obviously, is the internet was pretty, you can Google literally everything. You know, you can type in the internet, how do you invest in real estate? And like six hours, you can watch eight TED Talks and you're like 95% of the way home. But I was in LA because my family lives here. That's where I am now. There's a lot of really good real estate investors out here, mainly because that is a big source of wealth creation in Southern California. So I was fortunate enough just to go talk to them. It became very clear to me the buckets of how people make money in real estate. That became very clear very quickly. How to go through that deductive process of organizing in my mind. And that's how I do it today. Like just organizing the ecosystem and who's doing what. It basically got to the point where you're like, okay, here are the buckets. Which bucket are you going to be in? And then if you're going to be in that bucket, learn everything you can about how to be great in that bucket and then go. Yeah. And that opportunity set. So what were the real estate buckets and then where did you dive in? Largely speaking, real estate, as everyone knows, is in some ways like a long duration tip on some levels. And so you're trying to, in essence, buy bonds is kind of what they are. That's sort of how it intersects with my macro, which I like fixed income. I like rates. I mean, there's like this big intersection. And there's a lot of different business models that people pursue. There's the I'm just going to buy as many bonds as I possibly can and build this giant asset management firm. And I'm going to charge fees for literally just managing gallons and gallons of bonds. And if you look at the fixed income markets, generally like the non real estate, those are like your big PIMCO style funds, right? And then on the complete opposite side is probably like the distressed guys trying to bend the future to create value. So one group is not really trying to bend the future at all and effectuate much change. They make most of their money by making good timing and geographical and asset class decisions. The other piece is guys who are trying to add real big value, developers, people who rezone, those types of things. So to me, I didn't think I could add much 
in the first bucket because frankly, I actually, even to this day, I think the world has more than enough of those people. But it was the second bucket that interests me. And so that's where we went. And so how did you initially get started? The nice thing about real estate, which is different than the hedge funds, I mean, we'll go through the same conversation. How did you initially get started at hedge funds? It was yeah. a lot harder in the hedge fund business, particularly given my lack of perceived or real history in the, in the space. But in real estate, it's a bit easier because once you decide what your thesis is and what you're driving after, and then you go tie up a piece of real estate that fits within that thesis, which is at least the way I invest in real estate to this day. To some degree, the person is betting on the asset, probably the way most people look at it, myself included, because I've been on the other side of these conversations as an investor, not as a sponsor, is you're betting maybe 80% on the asset and 20% on the person. So that's an easier lift. You go tie something up, you run around, you talk to a bunch of people with money and you sort of convince them more about the asset than your own skills. And so that was sort of the way we started. And we had a thesis. I mean, we, and we are thematic real estate investors. We were then from literally the first day until today. In 20 years, it has not changed. We basically create themes and we invest against those themes. And so my theme then was that rezoning in Southern California had huge amounts of excess returns attached to it. Buying something that's zoned for X and rezoning it for Y creates enormous value. And nobody likes to do it, by the way. And even to this day, people hate it. The large institutional investors despise that risk. There's nothing that gets them excited about that risk. They almost have like a institutional prohibition on taking that risk, which also, by the way, almost guarantees that it's mispriced. But, you know, they view it as binary and all these other things. So they kind of run away from it. So, you know, we said, no, no, no we're going to go head deep into that. And we had some early success doing that. And frankly, that arbitrage started to collapse. And so we needed to come up with new themes. The next theme was Hawaii had had this very unusual real estate cycle because Japan had pumped so much money into it in the late 90s. By then, their crash kind of came later than everyone else's. And so historically, Hawaii trains at a big premium to the West Coast of the United States. But at that time, the West Coast, because it recovered faster, was trading at a big premium to Hawaii. So I literally just got on a plane and I just was like, okay, I'm going to spend two weeks here and just like learn everything about Hawaii. Maybe there's nothing here, but I'm just going to go here and just learn. I mean, the first most searing thing was how the local real estate developers were all like, what the hell are you doing here? Like, this is crazy. They couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. So that was great. And so we went head deep into Hawaii. And then we had to build the next deductive layer. We're like, okay, Hawaii works. You know what I mean? Like Hawaii is good. Now what are you going to do in Hawaii? And so we had some big success in investing in Honolulu. And at that point, we started to push deeper and say, we're willing to do more than just be land speculators. We're willing to develop. And so that was sort of the next iteration of our evolution as a firm which was a big deal, obviously, for us, because to go from land speculation to development and vertical construction was a big deal. Were you doing this deal by deal? Yeah. And, and as a matter of fact, in real estate, I believe investing in real estate out of funds is, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not a huge believer of it. Let me just sort of put it that way. I think it's not that great for the sponsor. It's great in the sense that you get a huge amount of capital under management, you get all these asset management fees and all this other stuff. But I think it makes you do stupid things. The alignment's all off and it just sort of encourages you to invest too aggressively at all points in the cycle. And I actually think it dulls your creativity. So yes, we were going deal by deal. We always went deal by deal. Like literally until a year ago, I don't think I ever had committed capital in real estate, which, you know, I don't know if that's anything to be proud of, but it definitely was reality. Is that tricky to navigate the transactions or do you just go through them on the assumption that you'll be able to access capital? Well, when you're young and and poor and maybe overly overconfident, it can cause some real problems, right? You get like 60 days to close and, you know, you get to the 60th day and you don't have the money. I mean, that's a problem. But over time, as we got better at our craft in the sense that people believed in what we were doing, that got a lot easier. We have two huge projects going on, which I'm sure we'll discuss at some point. And it's still a little bit of a hassle. Why don't we finish this off and talk about the projects that you are working on now and those themes? 
so I was investing all through the cycle from, we'll call it 09 to 2015, 16. And I went to Soros in 2017 and they asked me to sort of build a real estate platform. And I had to, again, sort of ask rainwater style questions, start with a white ship paper. What do you do? Those types of questions. And so on behalf of them, and then subsequently now back on behalf of just ourselves, unfortunately, we were asking those questions at a point in time where we were clearly late cycle. I personally have been a beneficiary of that as an investor for years, but just the very fact that I even now only have one asset left out of all the assets that I accumulated during that period tells you what my view was as to where we were in the cycle. So the question really was, what do we invest in? And the answer was, is okay, I'm only willing to invest in secular trends that I feel like will be persistent to plow through the cycle. Otherwise, I'm basically not willing to invest. And so the one we chose was investing in data centers and we continue to invest in that. And then the other one, which we've most more recently kind of, I don't know, tripped into is sound stages for content production. And so those two share in many ways, a lot of similarities and there's some non-similarities to them, but those are our two big platforms that we're working on. And we're excited about both of them. I mean, now, Ted, the final point would be now that the cycle has abruptly shifted due to COVID, we're actually staffing up and saying, okay, well, now we're willing to maybe widen the funnel of stuff that we're willing to look at and become more regular way real estate investors again. You know what I mean? Where we're willing to look at a broader array of deals and broader array of geographies and so on and so forth. But up until seriously two months ago, we were just stuck on these two verticals. So that sort of gives you a, a full, I think, uh, explanation of all of that. How does, how does the underwriting differ for real estate, like thematic real estate deals than what you just might expect from buying commercial property or something like that? Well, it shouldn't in the sense that in the end, the fundamentals of how many dollars do I put in and how many dollars do I get out and how quickly do they come out? I mean, that's all the same. I think where, Ted, it really differs is, I always used to joke that, and everyone knows this in the finance world, which is, you know, it's crap in, crap out. You can make any model tell you what, whatever the hell you want it to tell you. And I think that the way I look at investing, including in trading, I don't think there's actually any difference on this specific point, which is you have to be Socratic in your process and you have to challenge your assumptions constantly. And the way I look at investing, like my core principle as an investor is the harder it is to invert your argument, the more powerful your argument is. And so what I would say about thematic investing is it doesn't really change the numbers. You know what I mean? Meaning like, it's not like you're shooting for a lower IRR or a lower anything. It's just that it's harder to invert the arguments surrounding your assumptions. Whereas in non-thematic real estate investing, I think it's easier. You don't really come across too many people that are investing in private real estate and then trading macro. So, you know, why don't you take me through, you know, you're doing these thematic real estate investments and okay, there's a theme overlap, but how did you decide to get back into trading? Well, the world was in trouble in 05, 06. That was very obvious. The nice thing about real estate, this is a funny story. Everyone, and it's not to belittle people who are in real estate because I'm in it. So just I'm belittling myself when I say this, is that it's like one of the few asset classes where they have like, it's called Argus, a piece of software that helps everyone model the real estate. Almost all other private equity style investments, they build their own models and they don't have a standard model. But you know, real estate lends itself to a standard model. One of the things about that model is the big assumption is your, what's called your kegger, your compounded annual growth rate on the big assumption, right? Rent growth or something like that. And, and then obviously leverage. Those are the two big things in real estate. And so what dawned on me in the mid 2000s was, is you had to make these crazy heroic assumptions about the forward, the kegger and your leverage to get to what I even thought, not a, not a great return, just an acceptable return. And then of course, we were in residential real estate. I mean, at the end, we were selling condominiums. And so if you were selling for sale residential real estate, I mean, you really had to be blind. You know, you had to like shut your eyes to what was going on. And as a final point, I had moved to Hong Kong because I had started to invest in Macau. So I actually saw this as being an international problem, not just a US problem, because I had some now international exposure. And so 
I was just like, Jesus, what am I going to do? Like, I have this book of real estate assets and I can't sell all of them. How am I going to manage that? It was truly just like a personal wealth problem. And maybe it was an intertemporal problem, but you couldn't know, right? Like maybe it was like, okay, my real estate is so good that, you know, we'll go through this valley of death and come out on the other side and we'll be fine. But there's no way to know that obviously. So I started to look very aggressively for hedges. And there was a gentleman out here by the name of Jeff Green. He was very famous for how much money he made in the CDS mortgage trade, and then subsequently ran for office in Florida. But he's a really smart guy, very underappreciated as to how as good of an intuitive investor he is. Also a big real estate guy. And he had started telling me about the mortgage CDS trade because and there's a whole story about how he got in a fight with Paulson because Paulson pitched it to him and he did it himself and whatever. But anyways, he took me through it and I'm like, oh my God, this is perfect. I'm literally hedging the absolute very risk that haunts me at night. You know what I mean? Like this is not off target by even a millimeter. And so he brought this to me and I did the trade. That was really how I got into trading. And friends of mine had heard about the fact that I was starting to kind of wade into this stuff. And I'm self-taught in most things because I just didn't go the normal way, regular route, you know, of investment banking desk or a trading desk or whatever. And so I just was reading like crazy about every possible thing I could. Bill Gross, this guy, that guy, just to understand what was going on. And it was intoxicating. I mean, it was a truly intoxicating period of time. So honestly, it was by accident. If you asked me, Ted, in 2000 and eight, the summer of 2008, whether I would be a hedge fund manager, the summer of 2010, I would have said, you're crazy. There's no chance I'll be a hedge fund manager in the summer of 2010. I probably would have said to you, what do you mean? And you know, some version of like, I'm just doing this trade to like save my ass. Like I'm not doing this for anything else. So what changed so that you started trading in hedge fund format? Well, one, I had all these other people that wanted to trade with me. So one day I woke up and I'm like, well, I am a hedge fund manager. Like I'm managing other people's money. And this is insane. And, you know, I understood the regulatory risks of not doing it within a normal construct. That was like the base utility problem, right? Which is if you're going to do something, you got to do it so that it's not violating any regulatory issues. And then the second thing, honestly, was, is that the hits just kept coming. These big macro questions just kept coming. And I was like, well, how do I get off of this thing? This was like a bicycle for the mind. Wait, wait a second. I get to sit in an office all day and debate amongst the most important macro issues of the day. Like this was like a dream to me. You know, I'm like, wait a second, I get paid to do this and I can immediately bet on this. And no, 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 no. that was, and if you recall, like it was years of this, like it went all the way at least into and through the European sovereign debt crisis. So we're talking about four or five years of just massive big macro questions. Now, admittingly, eventually, a lot of those questions calmed down until more recently, of course. And then, you know, it's a competitive thing. And then, you know, you start raising money and you have large outside investors and Alan Howard becomes my partner and all these things just start changing. So it became easy after a certain point, let me put it that way, meaning to continue. So you had early on, you're kind of trading and screwing up on your own and then you have some principal experience in real estate, and then you know you start trading. How did you approach, let's just call it the macro hedge fund, in terms of how you thought about investing? Well, it's evolved a lot. I mean, I would say that when I first approached it, obviously it was more akin to how one trades their personal portfolio. I didn't really have a lot of appreciation for a lot of the risk parameter issues that now dominate hedge funds. And we can come back to that because the pendulum's probably swung too far in the other direction. But I had no real appreciation for a lot of that. My view was look at screen, try to make money, find a security that you're going to make money off of. Like it was pretty unidimensional, not really, I wouldn't say bad portfolio construction. I I was aware of what my risk was, but not very highly evolved portfolio construction. And also remember, Ted, that period of time, the risk premium was so high for a lot of the ideas that we had that there was a lot of margin for error anyways, in the sense that you were capturing huge amounts of risk premium. Now things have changed. You have to be more exacting. 
it's not as much risk premia. You can't really, I'm not saying get away with it, but you have to measure things closer to the millimeter than to the inch or, you know, some version there or foot even. So I would say that our early process on the thinking part is still very similar to what it was then and very good. And I would say the things that have changed a lot is on the risk management piece. And again, I think it's still a worthy debate for the entire industry to have as to whether or not the drive into these extreme risk management parameters is a good thing. I believe it causes everyone's returns to go down, but I think that's a choice. I don't think it's an obligation. I just think it's a choice. And for whatever reason, the industry has decided that that's a trade-off that either it wants to make or by accident it is making. I fear it might be more the latter than the former, but it is what it is. Let's put it that way. And then how about stylistically on the kind of return generation side? What is it that you're looking for in your trades? I'm definitely more of a mean reversion trader. And I think mean reversion, you and I had a brief conversation about this. I think mean reversion is really, really hard, especially in liquid markets. Being a distressed trader in illiquid markets, you know, you don't have a mark. You, know, you buy a piece of real estate and it goes down, but five years later, you were right. Nobody really knows that it went down for three months. Mean reversion in trading is very, very hard. It also is hard because when you're doing trend trading or you're doing breakout trading, it's clear where the break is. If it goes back below the break, just stop out and you're done. It's emotionally pretty easy. Mean reversion is like, well, it's really bad now. I don't think it could get worse, but maybe it's going to get worse. And you know, I have to leave bullets in my pocket in case it gets worse. And so that's literally like the story of my life. The story of my trading life is, I don't think it could get worse. <laughs> like, so that's our style. That's definitely our style. How have you know, in those early years post-law school and you, you were working in a couple of investment organizations that kind of didn't make it and macro strategies have this challenge over time of the communication gap between what you know and the risk reward of trades and then what investors understand, really the difference between, say, a slugging percentage business and a batting average business. How have you thought about explaining what it is you do so that investors get comfortable with the path of returns to get to the destination? It's been a really long process. My partner, Natalie, has helped me in communicating better about it. And we've kind of tried to make alterations to our business to help deal with that sidecars, you know, around specific trade ideas and so on. But yeah, it's a real challenge. I would say one of the huge challenges, which is probably endemic to the macro specifically is macro is probably the one trading style or investing style that generally doesn't have a very good value anchor, at least as it relates to sort of business school 101 Graham Dodd value style investing. And so you say, oh, well, I think the three-year Italian bond at 40 basis points is unbelievably cheap. And people are like, well, what do you mean it's unbelievably cheap? Like it's 40, you know what I mean? Like you have to go through all these explanations about, well, that's not cheap. Buying a company at four times cash flow, that's cheap. So that's a huge problem for macro people. And almost everyone that they ask for money are really well-educated on these value points and totally not educated on this. And they kind of feel like you're kind of making it up, right? Because they're just like, well... There is an element of like one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist as it relates to valuing securities and macro. It's very relative, FX in particular. And so, yeah, I think communicating with people about that, educating your clients about that is really, really important. We've kind of really shifted our model to the big trade model and to really raising sidecars around those big trades. And so, We've really gone deep into this process of educating our investors around how we think, why we think, and so on. It doesn't mean we get it right all the time, but our theory, and it's worked, is look, our ideas we think are robust enough. I mean, we understand timing. It's not like we pitch any idea at any time. We'll pitch the idea when it's appropriate. And we'll just say, look, this is very convex to multiple different outcomes. And if we're wrong, you won't lose that much. And if you're right, you'll make a lot. And sometimes, oh, by the way, this will help your portfolio a lot. So that's kind of where, where our whole business has shifted. And frankly, except for very few traders in our industry, I think it's kind of where macro people should try to turn to. I mean, I have a strong view that discretionary people should really push deeper that direction, not shrink away from it. I do think there's some discretionary traders that in macro, classic macro, that still are pre-naturally good at just consistently trading and 
creating these returns without doing what I just described. But I don't think there's many. Let me put it that way. I, I think it's very hard. So in the core part of the macro hedge fund from which you're spawning the sidecars, what does the portfolio look like in terms of either the number of positions or trades? It's gotten a lot more concentrated. That's good and bad in the sense that they look a lot more like, oh, this guy is just trading a sidecar with a couple extra trades on it. Because the risk parameters of the main fund is typically tighter on some levels than these sidecars, it can put a lot of pressure on you because it means that, well, okay, so you have fewer ideas. Your batting average has to be really, really high because you're not swinging as many times. And oh, by the way, you're not taking as much risk as you are in the sidecar. So even more, your batting average has to be well to give a, a proper rate of return, call it you know, seven to 10% return if you just run the sharp ratio of the VAR and all these other things. So that sort of equates to like a 0.75 sharp, which is probably as good as one can hope in macro. I mean, everyone wants to do a one, but nobody will get there. So I think it puts a lot of pressure on your main fund. But if you can convince your clients that one, obviously you're good at what I'm describing, and two, that a predominant number of them will at least participate in some of your sidecars, then you can make it pretty far with really good returns. And, you know, if you look at over allocation, if you will, to each trade, every time we said over allocate, and I think that's what we're trying to push people into, you know, we're trying to push our clients in that direction. And in a way it's a natural selection process. If they don't want to do that, I think they view us as being less interesting. If they want to do that, then I think they view us as really interesting. And I think that's kind of a good thing. If we're truly committed to this, then, I think that natural selection process is good because I think you want your investors to really know what you're doing because I think now it's really a strong partnership between your investors and yourself because otherwise I just don't think you can have a sustainable business in hedge funds easily. So you mentioned a couple of different things that could encapsulate into what one of your trades might look like. What is it that is kind of like an emblematic trade for you? I'll give you the best trade I ever saw that expresses the view that we have. But it was also a function of how screwed up the market was at the time. So I, I just want to warn you that we'd be so lucky to find a trade that looks like this again. But we were always a believer that Europe would not collapse. And we certainly were a strong believer of that during the first round of the sovereign debt crisis. And we really felt that it was hugely overpriced and all these other things. And a lot of people wanted to buy Italian and Spanish bonds during that period of time to express that view. We weren't the only ones who had that view. I'd say we were in the minority for sure. And obviously, a lot of real money around the world was actually shorting Spanish and Italian bonds to hedge their overall portfolio, which is good. I mean, you want that to happen, especially if you have the opposing view. So you have a structural bid against you that ultimately will dissipate if you're right. But what was really interesting was is you could buy the forwards which is a fancy way of saying a seven-year, seven-year bond in Italy, which is buying a 15-year bond and shorting an eight-year bond. And you're literally synthetically creating a forward. People buy forwards, obviously, in the rate markets all the time, three-year, one-year Euribor, or three-year, one-year US dollar swaps. And the dealer creates it for you, right? I mean, he's literally going in and you know, if you're long three or one, you're, you know, you're long a four and you're short a three, but the dealer does it for you. So you don't have to do it yourself. But in Italy, because they don't trade that way, you have to create the forward. The genius of the trade, though, was that the bond you were long was cheaper than the bond you were short in dollars, in dollar price. And so had Italy defaulted, in all likelihood, everyone would have had the same recovery rate. And so you likely would have ended up making money on that trade. So you had this really weird situation where if the absolute worst case scenario occurred, you made money. If the best case scenario occurred, you made a ton of money. And it was actually just the middle scenario, which was people would speculate like a little bit more that it's going to default, but not quite that it's going to definitely default. And that was your worst case scenario. But fundamentally, remember, it was only going to be one of those two states of the world. Like either Italy was going to default or Italy wasn't going to default. There was no way it could be the middle state. And there were hedges available in the middle state, just be long German bonds. So you had this really unbelievable structure to the market at that point in time. That was the best trade I'd ever seen because 
you literally knew that the odds you lose, even mark to market, were extraordinarily low at that moment. And I have not often been in those scenarios. I've been in scenarios where I say, well, the odds that I lose at the end point of my timeline is very low, but the path between here and there, I might lose quite a bit. And I'm always looking for this magic security like that I can lean up against the one that I like, you know, to sort of help me get through the path. And I can tell you that it's very hard to find that security, you know, really, really hard, partially because everyone else is looking for it, but also because central banks in their zeal to destroy volatility, they've created so much correlation that it's really hard to find anti-correlation is kind of a way to think about it. And also the best anti-correlation trade always was to be long rates. If you wanted to be long a good event, you know, you just say, oh, I'll just be long rates against it. And well, now that rates are zero everywhere, it's like, it's really, really hard to find that anti-correlant. So you really have this, a very different market structure. And so what I would say to you, Ted, is I have trades that I like where I could say to you, the odds that I'm right were the same as what my view of my odds were about being long seven year Italy, but I can't be as confident about the path for the reasons I just outlined. And so that's our big challenge. And frankly, that's where sidecars come in because if I can't manage the volatility quite as easily, but I do have this high conviction about the endpoint, then I need my investors to understand they just have to be willing to absorb more volatility to make it to home. And so that's how it all kind of comes together. I'm kind of curious of how you, you have these two activities side by side, this sort of private real estate investing and the, the macro trading hedge fund. Where do you see informational synergies across the two? I literally think that like being a real estate investor is so powerful for being a macro thinker. First of all, I think real estate's like the ultimate macro asset class. When you invest in private equity, you're literally investing on a company, like a company. I buy an apartment building in Austin. I got 500 companies in that apartment building, right? The employees probably work for 500 different companies. Now, of course, I'm investing on a, a bite based on a street corner. and But at the end of the day, I'm making an interest rate call. I'm making probably a geography call. And then I got to make the entry price call. But generally speaking, that's what I'm doing. The other thing worth noting is that the real estate market, it's the biggest asset class in the end. I mean, if you really look at it globally, it is the big consumer of capital. When you think about like Fed policy, ECB policy, and so on, of course, there are policies about creating liquidity and easing financial conditions, of course, touches stocks and corporate bonds. But the volume of real estate globally dwarfs by factors the total volume of bonds and, and shares. By way of example, two years ago when interest rates were going up, I went to all of my real estate friends and I said, look, if you had to refinance your portfolio at X, please tell me what X is that equals zero equity. So said differently, where are you bankrupt? And you would have been shocked, by the way, Ted, not only shocked, but scared by the answer to that, to that number. You would have been like, holy shit, really? These guys are broke at that level? Yeah, broke. Another question, go to my friend Rick Beckwith, who runs Lennar. What's the monthly payment that gets people to buy homes at Lennar? Where is the fulcrum monthly payment? Where do your buyers start to puke? You can back into another interest rate analysis there. Well, the point really is a couple of years ago when interest rates were X and my partner was like, oh, no, 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 Jamie Dimon told me interest rates could go to five or 6%. I'm like, no, not a chance. They go to five to 6%. Every real estate investor that we know is bankrupt. They're not hanging on. They're broke and dead. And every home builder in America has no customers. That's a fact. And one of the other problems you have to appreciate, Ted, is that in a highly levered economy where everyone just cares about their monthly payment. Remember, everyone now has refinanced into this term structure of interest rates. Every homeowner, every commercial real estate investor, all the private equity guys, of course, they run their whole business on a monthly payment. That's what people don't really realize. So if you have a step change in that monthly payment, 
where you have an economy that's hugely dependent on leverage, financial leverage, to propel forward. That tells you everything you need to know about interest rates. And the Rosetta Stone of macro investing is interest rates. It is the Rosetta Stone. It is the security or set of securities that really radiates out to every other security in the world. Of course, that's why we all watch Fed policy so carefully. It's that radiation of those policies that has this magical effect on all other securities. Real estate stands as because it's such a levered asset class. Just think, Ted, about how few entities in the world depend on leverage. Now, you could say, oh, Microsoft or Amazon or whatever. But by the way, it's actually deceiving. Of course they do, because their customers are broke at a certain wrong interest rate. So even those guys who have trillions of cash and no problems whatsoever from their own balance sheets, they need solvent customers. So what I would say is, is real estate is a beautiful window into this issue of financial conditions. And of course, the time frame that you invest in real estate is over numbered in years and in macro, it's numbered in months or days sometimes. And that, of course, is the huge difference. But I'm trying to find these big fulcrum points. Like, I'll give you an example about Italy. People look at Italian bonds and they say, oh, well, Italian bonds at 39 basis points, what's the problem? I'm like, I'll tell you the problem. Their inflation is negative, so their real rates are unbelievably high. Why do real rates matter? Again, if you run a levered economy, everything's about real rates. So if you're a guy who owns a piece of real estate and your rents are going down, even if your interest rate is zero, you're broke because your effective borrowing cost, even if it's at zero, is positive. That's why deflation is so pernicious for a levered economy. So that's kind of how it intersects for me. And I, I, I'm just reminded about it all the time. And I wouldn't say, Ted, that it's like every day I look at real estate and then bring it over into the trading floor. I'm just saying that understanding these fulcrum points in the real estate community has a huge impact on my view of where we are as it relates to the cycle and in interest rates. So as you're looking out, real conviction that rates can't go up, where are you looking for opportunities on the macro side? Well, we're coming off of an extraordinary period of time for us where you know, we had this collapse in interest rates and we were there, as I tried to describe two years ago, because we sort of felt like people just don't understand how tight financial conditions are. And so now COVID obviously was this massive accelerant. So I don't want to say that we were there for that, but we're coming off of that. And I brought up Italy. I mean, we've been strongly of the view that at least in the short term, they're going to pull everything together in Europe. So we're kind of at the end of this gestation period of these trades that I just highlighted. Honestly, as you and I are, I wish on today's podcast, I had this brilliant trade, new trade that I'm pitching. You know, I got it. It's there. But unfortunately, I'm here to tell you, I don't got it. Okay. Like I'm looking for the elephant and I don't see it. And I have a whole list of potential ones, but they're very nascent and they're not really well formed and they're not really ready. But I would say to you that it doesn't make for an interesting podcast and it's unfortunate because, hey, I wish we had this great trade that we could go into. But it is really important to note that just saying I don't have a good idea is arguably more important than saying you have a good idea. I think one of the problems in our industry, particularly in macro, is there's this just need, this almost driving need to constantly have a good idea. I mean, macro is interesting, right? So we could have this conversation about all these macro topics and everyone loves those conversations. That's why like a lot of clients take macro meetings, if nothing else, just to sit and have those conversations. I'm not sure they all want to write tickets at the end of it, but they do like to have the conversation. But sometimes the answer is, I don't have a trade. And so unfortunately, I'm in one of those situations where I think, I always think there are interesting macro, macro topics, of course, but I don't think there's any trade that jumps out at me. Now, admittingly, there's going to be guys over the next month, I'm sure, who are going to post decent numbers in macro, but that's the element of the casino. Just because a guy made money at the table doesn't mean that it's a good actuarial bet. And that's this whole thing of luck for skill. So for me, I don't have anything. For me, if I were to make money outside of the residual trades that we have, 
I'm not saying it's it's luck, but I would say to you that it's not off of this sort of blinding conviction. You know, we've touched around the edges a little bit of structure of the business and where this is going. You have real estate assets, you have some macro strategies, you have some sidecars. What's your perspective on the structure of where the industry is going over the next few years? You have two sides of it, right? You have the allocators and then you have the hedge funds. And in some ways, obviously, they're married to each other, whether they like it or not. So you could come at it from either direction. I always come at it from the allocator side because I sort of say to myself, well, if I understand what's going to happen there, then I can make some predictions about what's going to happen in hedge fund land. And when I say predictions, like I said, there's always these exceptions to rules. I think Jeff Talpins is like an amazing macro investor. And so like, I think Jeff can just keep running his business the way he's been running his business for a long time. And that's great. But I think for people maybe who, who don't have those set of superpowers that he has, you know, I think they're going to be subject to the vicissitudes of the industry. I just want to assume that I'm going to be in that bucket instead of the other bucket. It's safe to assume that. So when I look at it, I say that the allocators have just a ridiculous problem, which is they need to produce a set of returns. They all effectively have a bogey that they need to hit. And, and of course, individual investors have it as well. It's just sort of more implicit than it is explicit. And let's just be honest, you have a 10-year treasury at 81 basis points. That should tell you about what the anchor of returns are. I mean, return the risk-free rate is kind of being pulled down everywhere, which means everyone's returns should come down pretty substantially. And there aren't that many ways to basically produce excess returns your excess returns are gonna come through timing, asset allocation, and then leverage. Timing's the hardest. It's what hedge funds basically are asked generally to do. And I think we can all agree with the number of managers that exist today, and then they're also competing against machines, that the alpha available to timing has declined, it might be negative. That's a very reasonable estimate that it's negative. Then you have asset allocation and leverage and asset allocation is a hedge fund manager can't really answer to that because that the allocator is answering to. And leverage is obviously being answered by my other side of my business, my real estate side, and then also by the private equity guys. And then obviously sometimes there's sort of internal leverage that's going on through managed accounts and all these other things. So let's go back to the point where hedge fund managers are basically asked to engage in timing because that is basically what they're being asked to do. And the question is, is can they do that? Well, I'm being asked to do it in macro. And what I've said to you, Ted, is that I think you can do it. I think the number of times you can do it is small. I think you have to acknowledge that machines now dominate the market. And so you need to actually say to yourself, what are the usual profile of places, number one, that a machine can't do this better than you? And number two, is there a set of trades that repeat themselves that humans miss where you can add value? So that's where we are. That's where I am as Commonwealth is I got to find trades where machines can't intervene and where I can find persistency of, in essence, human error. And I would say to you that the number of them are small. And that's why I've asked my investors to say, look, I'm ex ante telling you with all humility, there aren't 50 of these. There's a small number and I need you to lever up when they come. Because if I don't capture the right tail of the distribution on these, then we're not going to have extraordinary returns. That's it. That's pretty much our whole thesis. All right, Adam, I want to get a chance to turn to a couple of closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Skiing. Straight up. Hands down. <laughs> Hands down. It's not even close. <laughs> All right. If you started your career over today and we're going to take investing away from it since that's been a passion for so long, what would you like to do? Justice to the Supreme Court. Why? Oh, I just love the law. I mean, absolutely love the law. By the way, in today's environment, boy, could it not be more important. Western civilization is literally built on the law. And 
it's a fragile thing. I don't think people realize the fragility associated with the law and the fact that it's a human made thing and it needs to be nurtured. And I think it's the best gift we as people who live in the Western world could give to our children is to double down on it. It's the best operating system ever invented. It's better than Microsoft, it's better than Google, it's better than all of them. Without it, none of those things exist. And you're nervous about what'll happen from here? Yeah, very. Because I think that we've lost our way. You know, when you walk into a courtroom, there's a woman with a scale and she's blindfolded. It's the blindfold that's the important part. The blindfold represents humility and it represents dispassion and it represents the desire to basically see, seek truth irrespective of bias or passion. Do I need to elucidate on the topic of the world <laughs> we live in to say that we have lost our way on that? What's your biggest pet peeve? A lack of self-awareness. How about your biggest investment pet peeve? Same, identical. Because I think that most errors in investing are a result of internal biases and they're literally the same. The, the sort of macro world, how do you go about preparing yourself on a day-to-day -day basis to be in the right mindset to make it work? Well, I have like these crazy, and by the way, my investors, my Natalie, who like, it's a bit embarrassing. Like she put this, this whole manual together, like all these things that I do. And I have real like, I don't know, misgiving is the right thing. It, it feels like it's, you know, a bit contrived, but if you can convince me that it'll help me, I will try anything to be better at the things I just described. So I'll try anything in essence to remove my biases to be better at making decisions because that's what people are paying me to do. And so I do think that as a human being, you know, because we're not machines, we obviously live in a body and, you know, we have emotion and, and I think all the physiological elements of ourselves, we are not wired to be dispassionate about evaluating facts and topics. We're not wired that way. That's the tribalism you see right now in the political environment. And so I do think you have to work very hard at making sure you can push back against that diet, exercise, meditation, all these things. I think they all integrate together. Some people, to be fair, don't need those things. I mean, you know, I know I need those things. I need a lot of routine. I need a lot of, of those things in my life to be as effective sleep. I mean, I could go hours on sleep the least appreciated medicine in the world is sleep. I mean, it's just ridiculous how people behave with respect to sleep. So all of those things, and I work really hard at them, just like everything else, I'll dive deep into each one of those topics to make sure that I'm optimizing. What teaching for your parents has most stayed with you? I'd say being optimistic, not being envious, jealousy. Again, going back to that woman that you walk in and you see in a courtroom, it's pretty hard to be a good decision maker if you're being driven by those things. And, you know, I've been really lucky to be the guys that I see. I mean, I, I'm just around some really amazing people in our industry. Alan, of course, who's my partner, Alan Howard, but Lewis Bacon's a friend. I mean, Joe Lewis, these guys are all older than me, but it's just being around those guys and realizing that, and it's not because they're wealthy. I don't think people get it. They are, passionate, optimistic, enthusiastic, want to learn. Joe Lewis is an 83 year old guy. Like he's like one of my closest friends. And you know, when I spend time with him, I have no idea what age he is because the passion that he exudes is unbelievable. So I was lucky to be raised in a house where there was a lot of optimism and a lot of passion and a lack of jealousy and envy. So those were, those were the big things for me. Great. All right. Uh, Adam, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? Make sure you surround yourself with those the type of people that I'm talking about and work violently almost to eject the people who don't fall into that category. And unfortunately, people are very good at hiding that from you. So work aggressively to figure out who falls into that category and make sure they're not in your lives because they will cause all sorts of havoc. Great. Well, Adam, thanks so much. Really fascinating. Ted, I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time.
This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. All opinions expressed by guests on this show are solely their own opinion and do not necessarily reflect those of their firm. A manager's appearance on the show does not constitute an endorsement or investment recommendation by TED or Capital Allocators.